Well, today we'll be carrying on. We'll be in Romans chapter 4. Or not Romans, I said Galatians chapter 4. We finished up Galatians 3 last week. So we're in Galatians chapter 4, beginning in Galatians chapter 4. Okay? Well, let's pray and we'll get started. Dear Father, I just want to just thank you for your word. just want to just uh, thank you for giving the books that we can, we can look to, to get our own, so that we can be certain, that we can build up the things that we do know, and we can correct the things that we're making mistakes on. And just want to thank you for having that. Thank you for preserving it. I just want to just pray that this message would be helpful to the holes to hear it. just want to pray for me also teaching it. I just want to just thank you in all these things. I mean, I made it all possible by Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> remember the book of Galatians has to do with legalism creeping into an established church. It isn't a church built on legalism. It's a, it's a church that started without the legalism. And then here it comes. Now, at the time when the Galatians would have been reading this, okay, when they would have been reading this, it would have been pertinent to them right then. It is a letter that is addressed to them. So it should make sense to them, and we should be able to read it in the context that this is written to a group of people, churches in the Galatia region, where what is happening? The idea of circumcision and what comes after that? The following of the law. It wasn't started that way, but it's coming in. Where is that coming from? It's coming from a bunch of zealous Jews. Okay, there's a, to, to be to be zealous. Okay, all uh, all zealous of the law. Um, we've got we've got Galatians chapter four here. Galatians chapter four. Uh, verse, verse 17. Galatians 4, 17. Galatians 4, 17. You got Galatians 4, 17? Also get Acts 21. Acts 21, 20. Acts 21, 20. Galatians 4 and Acts 21, 20. All right, so we'll start in Galatians 4. Verse 17. They zealously affect you, but not well. Who's the they? These law observers. Now, no, notice, notice the term zealously. Okay, that comes from zealous. They zealously affect you. Now, keep Galatians 4. Come to Acts 21. Verse 20. Now here is James, okay? James, the Lord's brother. And he says, skip the, okay. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews which are there. Let me start again. Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. And they are all, what? Zealous of the law. Okay? So that's, that's a term. Okay? I'm zealous. Why? What am I? I'm an active law follower. Okay? Now take that idea and insert it into Galatians 4 and verse 17. The law followers affect you, but not well. Okay, you see what I'm seeing I'm doing there? I'm trying to insert an idea. They zealously affect you. This group of people that are coming into the region of Galatia. But it's not well, but they're affecting you. They have influence. Yea, they would exclude you. What do you mean? They would, they would cut you off from God's blessing just because you're not circumcised. You understand? If you don't get on the program with what they're saying to be doing, they just say, nah, I mean, you don't count. You're out. That ye might affect them. Now, verse 18. 
But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. Okay? So the thing that's being brought in is a bad thing. Now, it's okay if it's a good thing. And then he says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Okay, what's he doing? He's going, through the, he's going through the labor pains in order to bring them out again. Okay? That's the point. He's like, oh, for crying out loud, i got to go back to... I thought we were through that. Okay? So now, let's back up to Galatians 4. Galatians 4.1. He's going to talk about an heir. Okay? He's going to talk about an heir. Galatians 4.1. Now I say that the heir. What is the heir? That's the inheritor, right? Okay? You have a family possession in which the father is in possession of and he says this individual is the heir what does that mean and he gets all i have he's he's the possessor okay he differeth nothing from a servant when he's a child right now i say that the heir as long as he is a child differeth nothing from the servant though he be lord of all he's the inheritor Okay, but when he's young, does he look anything other than a, than a servant? Now, is a servant being educated, a young servant? You better believe he is getting prepared for whatever purpose, a job, and education is necessary, right? Is the child getting educated for whatever job is necessary? And the answer is yes, okay? We're all learning things in order to be an adult, Okay, so the servant child in their adulthood has certain duties, right? And the heir in his adulthood has certain duties. And when they're kids, they're learning the same curriculum. They have to have some fundamental things, okay? But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. He's in school. Someone that is taking care of this education in order to grow them up, to mature them into adulthood. Now, our supposed ed education system, okay, I said supposed because it's kind of a disgrace, I'll be honest, okay. My sister's a school teacher, by the way. My father's a school teacher, by the way. My uncle was a school teacher, by the way. I'm not a school teacher, but I think it's a disgrace. I've watched it, Okay. But the principle of it is, is that what do we teach a kindergartner? Basics. Very basic. But what are they? They're the building blocks that we now keep having to keep using, right? When a kindergartner is learning their ABCs and learning how to count, do you count every day? Do you use the ABCs? Well, you're using them right now. Did it ever get unnecessary to use it? No. It's an essential building block, no matter what job you're in, really. Okay? Then we build, and we build, and we build. And the hypothetical theory of it is, is that by the time we get through these 13 years of education, that we have enough essential building blocks to begin our function in society. To begin. Okay? You're not mature and at the top of your game. When you're, you might think you are when you're 18 years old and you just graduated high school. And then you go to college and then you think, oh yeah, I really am and my parents are so dumb. Okay? But you can't, you can't rob the time. Okay? And is it a growing process progressively? Yes, it is. And it's a shame what our culture has done to our elderly people have tons of wisdom tons of wisdom that they've spent a lifetime realizing. Grandparents here? Anybody a grandparent here? Everybody. Okay. 
All right. You know things that were terribly important to your children, you're like, ah, and you get all over that? What about with your grandkids? Well, that's not necessarily as important as one thought it was, was it? Wisdom. But this issue is important. And maybe mom and dad aren't realizing that. But I, I see the value in this issue. But this one over here, after been through it, not so much. That's wisdom. Now, if the young people were smart, they would try to glean, at least analyze that wisdom. Is it just because grandma and grandpa have gotten so dumb in their old age that they think that this isn't a big deal? But why do they think this is a big deal? Experience. Okay, our culture has robbed that. Back to the main subject matter. Okay. Now, we're talking about education. Even so, so he makes this comparison between, okay, between the servant and between the heir. They're both going to be doing job as they mature. And you can't really tell the difference because they're, the, they're getting the curriculum. That he said, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Who's the we in that case? Well, who was in bondage to the elements of the world? Okay. Well, we had two groups. We had Jew and Gentile. Circumcision and uncircumcision. We're in bondage of the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. What fullness of the time was come? Daniel chapter 9. Seventy years are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. Seventy weeks, excuse me, not seventy years, I said it wrong. Seventy weeks. For 190 years are determined. To what? To finish the transgression. Right? To anoint the most holy. So at a specific time in history that you can start, the starting point is that as of the rebuilding of the city, there's a limited timeline. Within 490 years, that was to be accomplished. That's why when John the Baptist shows up and he said, kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. He said, what gospel? The kingdom's coming, people. God sent me to prepare the way because the Lord's coming. See that? But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. He sent him forth to what? Well, it tells you. Made of a woman, under the, made, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem, to redeem, to buy them back. To redeem them that were under the law, that we, all the group in Galatia, also including you and me, what is a group of Galatia predominantly made out of? A bunch of Gentiles. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the what? The adoption of sons. Now, is that a new term, adoption, in Paul's epistles? No. Before and between songs, we were talking about that in Romans 8. To wit, the redemption of our body. So this is not new information as far as us if we were to read our Bible progressively. So it, when, we, when we're reading this in Galatians, if, if, if all we had done is read Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, and now we're into Galatians, do we know that we have an adoption? We should. We should know that. Okay? And he says, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So the redemption of them under the law has a part of us receiving the adoptions of sons. Okay? Now, what is the adoption? That's the actual event, declaration, when you become that full mature status. Okay? The adoption. When you're adopted, you have your... Yeah, yeah, you... You might be an heir, but until that adoption, can you execute, execute the full benefit of being that heir? I know I sure can't. I can't go through that wall without going through a door or a window that's open. 
Can Jesus do that? Amen. He sure can, right? So I can't execute what that authority actually brings right now because my body is the problem. I'm waiting for the adoption. Am I still an heir? I sure am. Are you still an heir? You sure are. And because ye are sons. Now you can't tell the difference between an heir and a servant right now in, amongst us, can you? We're all being educated the same, right? We're all going through life under tutors and governors until when? The time appointed. Okay, so there's an adoption that's coming. That's when you and I are, are declared at our full mature status. Now what comes along with that? That redeemed body. Okay, that doesn't have the sin problem that this body has. That God isn't constantly making intercession for, on my behalf, for his purpose, okay, so that my election is going to happen. Your election is going to happen. Now, and because ye are sons, so regardless of, of what it looks like right now, you, even though you might not be able to tell the difference, you are sons. God hath forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now that term has been used three times in the New Testament. Abba, Father. And you know what, that, you know what Abba means? Father. It's a Chaldean word of saying it. Okay? Father, Father. Now this is used three times. This is used here in Galatians 4. This is also used in Romans 8. Okay, Paul uses that term. And it's the same ter term the Lord used in Mark 14 when he's praying to the Father. And he says, Abba, Father. See how intimate that is? See how close that is? He's at the absolute... Jesus Christ is at the point of his life where everything is riding on a decision. And he could have made that decision. He could have said, I'm not doing it. But what did he say? Not thine will, not my will, but thine will. Quite frankly, you know what that tells me? He said, take this away from me. Why do you want? You want to do it. But he did anyway. That's called maturity. Right? Everybody here is a parent? How many things you had to do in your life you didn't want to do? You didn't, that's the last thing you wanted to do? I don't want to do it, I don't want but it needs to be done. Because why? No one else is going to do it. No one else can do it. He did it. Okay? That's how, that's how close we are. And we don't even realize it. At least I don't. Abba Father. Wherefore, in conclusion to this Abba Father that's crying out in your heart, thou art no more a servant, but what? A son, an heir, heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. Okay, that's what Romans 8 tells you. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Is this new information? No, it's repeating old information we've already had in the book of Romans. But he said, in light of this, how be it? Okay, nevertheless, is what he's saying. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. Excuse me, how be it? Then when you knew not God, when you didn't know him, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. What were they doing service to? Something that's not the God of heaven. Not, it's not God of heaven and earth. Not the God of Israel. They were doing service to something else. People. False gods. But now, after that, ye have known God, or rather are known of God. Isn't that interesting? Before that time, before our salvation, we weren't known of God. 
Isn't that interesting? But now, after that, ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to, here gives examples, weak and beggarly elements. Why are you all of a sudden going into a physical process here now? Now, now after you're known of God, you know God, why are you turning to carnal, that means physical, activities for God's blessing? Why now? You were in that before, okay? You've got the message of God's grace, okay? He bought you back, two-thirds, you're waiting on your body, and now you're going to the physical? What's wrong with you? Because here's what it is. Now he says, listen, now you look like the servant. Read this. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how ye turn again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Okay. Come with me to the book of Acts, chapter 15. Peter says this. Acts 15 and verse 10. This is actually Peter. I'll start in verse 9. Verse 9. So, so Peter is recounting his experience with a bunch of Gentiles that he was told to go to by God, which is totally unnatural to the law, totally contrary to the law. The Jew doesn't go to the Gentile. The Gentile goes to the Jew. Okay? And there's still a division, there's a separation. Okay? So now, Acts 15, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by what? By faith. The problem between the Jew and Gentile is one was, one was clean and one was unclean. Okay? But if you're pure, are you clean? Amen. It's a purification process. Did they go through the purification process? They sure did. What was it? Purifying their hearts by faith. So now he could go to the household of Cornelius, because why? Because Cornelius was praying to God. Cornelius knew something about Jesus Christ. Verse 10, now, therefore, why tempt ye to God, what tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? You know what's a yoke for? I drew a picture of this. There we go. A yoke. Let me get rid of my other. See that? Here's the yoke. He's carrying that. What's he carrying? He's carrying the law. He's carrying the law. It's upon his shoulders. He said, we weren't, we or our fathers weren't able to bear it. Okay? But where does that come from? You put a yoke on an ox, right? Why? It's in order to accomplish the job that needs to be done. In this case, normally, what are they doing? They're pulling a cart, they're pulling a wagon, they're pulling a plow, they're pulling an implement. They're carrying something. They're a worker. Okay? What does an ox represent? Priesthood. The priesthoods are workers. Okay? He said, why are you... That, that's ultimately what it is. Okay? And he said, we're not able to bear that. We weren't able to. Why are you putting it on them? Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? They failed at it. So, 
Do, would, would we already understand that if we're reading this thing progressively? Yes, because Acts 15 definitely comes before the book of Galatians, right? If we're reading it progressively, we would know that. Okay? So now, let's go back to Galatians 4. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire to be in bondage? What does he say? That person said, you know what that looks like? A servant. You're an heir. Ye observe days and months and times and years. You know what that's a part of? That's a part of being a servant. You know what that comes from? Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 gives you what? Begins with by giving you times and observant times. Okay? It gives you the day in which you slay the Passover lamb. Now, is the Passover lamb been slain or not? Nod your head, yes. Amen. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been crucified. Right? So, is the Passover lamb, has he been slain? Amen. Okay. So now, so that 14th day of the month, there's a time. They'd been observing it, observing it, observing it, observing it, observing it. They've been practicing and rehearsing this thing. Meanwhile, they're going to the lamb's throat, letting that thing drop. And they take that blood, as they catch that blood, and they'd use that as an offering. And they're practicing that. On, but you know what God's seen the whole time they're doing that? He's seen this. And they didn't even know it. Okay? At the same time that Jesus Christ is on the cross, guess what the religious leaders are doing? They're slaying their lamb without blemish and spot. The one that had been living with them for the past, however, since the 10th day of the month until they were separated. And they were observed to make sure that they were without spot and blemish. It was taken care of, it was nurtured, and then they killed it. At the same time, Jesus Christ is in the temple being observed. And the people are coming to him. And they're saying, and he's and they're coming to him for their, for their instruction. And meanwhile, the religious leaders are saying, well, what about this, and what about that, and what about that? And eventually, they just quit saying anything, because every time they did, what happened? He made them look bad. And he did it, and he was all without blemish or spot. He was in amongst them. He was in God's house. That lamb was in their house. You understand the picture? So the lamb that had been in their house, they killed, and they just, you know... And the lamb that was in God's house, what did they do? They killed. This book. Who, would have, who could have come up with that from Exodus 12 when that was first set up? I mean, think about that. Who writes a book like that? You observe days and months and times of years. There's another one, Leviticus 25. It talks about the year of Jubilee. You know, when I was a kid, there was a, there was a piece of farm machinery here. It's called the Jubilee. Okay? What's the idea of Jubilee? So much blessing, and everything goes back. Everybody becomes wealthy again. Everything resets. Your debts are over. Why? Because God has blessed you with a great blessing, and you share that amongst your brethren. You bought your brother out of, out of a problem. He might have sold himself into bondage. What happens? Goes out at Jubilee. He ain't there forever. What about that debt? Goes out at Jubilee. Wonderful concept, isn't it? Too bad they didn't do it. It's part of the reason why they're in the mess that they were in. So now... That's a part of observing days and months and times. All right? So now, in Pentecost, okay, so let's do a little bit of a timeline as long as I'm talking about it here. All right. We have 
I'm going to draw it like this. We have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which begins with, this was out of Exodus 12, where they painted the doorposts, right? What is that? That's the cross. Same timing. The next feast after that, okay, the next thing after that, they, they're out, they're at Mount Sinai. And what do they get? They get the law. What's that? That's Pentecost. Wait, that's Acts 2. Well, what happened in fact, Acts 2? God made the religious leaders look bad by having a bunch of fishermen speaking in another tongue, fulfilling Isaiah 28. With stammering lips and men of another tongue, will I speak to this people? Why? Because those that are speaking in Hebrew aren't speaking the words of God. That happened. Gift of the Holy Ghost, they start speaking. Men and brethren, what shall we do? <laughs> what are they speaking about? God's going to get you. Uh-oh. What should we do? Repent. Change. You weren't baptized before under John's baptism. You weren't baptized under Jesus Christ's baptism. What do we need to do? Repent and be baptized. And then you'll be on the same playing field as the rest of us. Join in. Okay. Have those things happened? Yes. Okay. There's only one thing that needs to happen in the future of the three feasts, and it's tabernacles. Okay, now a tabernacle is some sort of tent, dwelling, okay? Where a person can receive shelter, okay? That has to do with God coming and dwelling in their midst and them dwelling in the land. That has to happen in the future. But these two have. And he's telling them, he said, all right, you former pagans, why on earth are you going under this stuff? It was never given to you, and we're not doing that right now. Okay. How do I know we're not doing this now? Hold your hand here, back up to Romans chapter 11. Now, if we're reading progressively, we obviously would have read Romans chapter 11 before we're reading Galatians chapter 4. Now, it seems almost silly that I'm saying that, but I want to actually drive home the fact is, is that this, these books have been collated in an order designed by God. They just didn't. They weren't written in this order. This is divinely inspired of how one hooks to the next, to the next, to the next. Right now, verse Romans eleven fifteen, verse thirteen. For I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Verse thirteen. I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh. My flesh meaning they're my brothers because we're all of the children of Jacob, the children of Israel. And might save, what? Some of them. For if the casting away of them be the what? The reconciling of the world. What shall the receipt of them be? but life from the dead. You think, if the reconciling of the world is a big deal, when we get them back, remember the, re, remember the, uh, the parable about the two sons? And the first son comes back, or excuse me, the one that went away came back, he said he was dead, now he's alive, this is a big deal. And the other one's like, I never got no party thrown for me. He never put a ring on my finger. He said, listen, he's back from the dead. That's the idea. I thought, I thought he was gone for good. He was as good as gone. That's going to be a big deal in, in, in the future of our history, in the world's history, in the universe's history.
Now, let's back up a little bit. Now if the, verse 12, verse 12, now if the fall of them, Israel, be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Okay? Let's back up a little bit more. Verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Who's the election? Those that believed. According as is written. And he quotes it. He quotes what, what David says. Okay? So now, back to Galatians 4. Ye observe days, verse 10, mo months and times and years. I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of you. Why? Now let's just think about this. Who was running around giving Paul the business? Who followed him from city to city in order to undo everything that he'd just done? His kinsmen, Jews by nature. This thing keeps there. Guess what? The people that I converted that are now in God's family are going to get me. And that really isn't the real big problem, but it's less, it says, I'm afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. I went through this, all that you could turn to what he's calling vanity. It's empty. Not even worth it. I wasted my time. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am. For I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Now you're going to go with a little bit of history of them. And he says, You know how that through the firmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation in my flesh he despised not, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Angel of God. What's an angel? It's a messenger. Okay. Moses was, was referred to as an angel. Okay. Back in Hebrews 1. Okay. You received me as a messenger with the equivalent status of Moses. Where is this blessed as you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you had plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Talk about the caring for them. And he says, where would that go? I mean, when I was there before setting this thing up and everything like that, you'd have laid down your life for me. You've given something that you needed, given it to me. Oh, I mean, that's a big deal. You'd have plucked out your own eye. Well, who would do that? That's a big deal. He said, where did that blessedness go? Now you're on the opposite end of the gamut. What happened? Verse 16, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell the truth? Ah, the truth divides. Imagine that. Yep, truth causes divisions. Doctrine divides. Yes, it does. Amen. Absolutely. They zealously affect you. Remember we talked about that? Why? These law, these law followers zealously affect you, but not well. He would that they would, excuse me, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. Now, the interesting thing about that is, is that how has that whole system worked? It's supplied through the sacrificial system. Uh-oh. Now what are they doing? They're bringing tribute. To whom? To Israel. Okay. Now, there's nothing wrong with giving tribute, right? But do you have to? No. But can you? Yes. Under the law, was it an option? No. Was it an option? You're obligated. 
See that? Verse 19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Nailing the law to his cross. Isn't that Colossians 2? I think so. Let me look. Yeah. Colossians 2.14. Blotting out the handwriting ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Okay? Now I skipped ahead. But is that idea already set up in the book of Galatians? And yes, it is. See how this thing builds on itself? It's not a new monumental idea by the time we get into Colossians. It's actually review and rebuilding on it. Now, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. From what I am hearing... I got to see this thing for myself here because what I am hearing, this is an absolute utter, this thing's in shambles. Okay? It went from one thing to the other. I'd like to be here right now. I'd like to really see it, what, what, what this thing is, but he's writing him a letter. Why? Because he can't be there. For I stand in doubt of you. Now I'm doubting what? What you're established on. Then he says, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? You read that thing? Look what's in, look what's in the writings that contain the law. For it is written, Abraham had two sons. Actually, Abraham had eight sons. But he's going to concentrate on two sons. Okay? Abraham had eight sons by three different women. Hagar, Sarah, and it just left me. Keturah. He has Ishmael. Hagar is the Egyptian woman, right? She's Egypt. She's from Egypt. Now notice, the Egyptians actually pushed out the nation of Israel. Okay? God describes it like a birth. Thrust out. There wasn't an option to stay. And they leave. Okay? Tuck this thing under here so I can write on top of it. I'll booger it all up. Alright. Maybe we can still see that. So they're thrust out. And they cross, and I'm going to draw a path like this. And they wind up over here, okay? That's a mountain, hypothetically, right here. That's Sinai. Across the Red Sea, my line's a little high. Let me... Anyway, you get the point in case I can't get it right. But So they cross, and they wind up here. That's the time when Pentecost is being celebrated every year, observed every year. And where do they get there? They get the law there, okay? Now, this area right here is Arabia. Okay? This area right here, this is Arabia. Okay? Now, the reason why my line's a little bad here, okay, let me just try to fix that, but, okay? They went down, they came down in here, in this area right here, they got trapped in here, and they crossed here. Why do I say that? How else would they be entangled in the land? And why else would Paul say, what he's going to say here, and he says Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia. So, Jer 
So he talks about his two sons, and he says, one that is by the bondwoman, who is an Egyptian. That's interesting. It was just the other way around that they came out of Egypt, right? And he says, Egypt's the one that's bound. Okay? One by a bondmaid, another by a free woman. So, the slave girl becomes a second-rate wife to him. All right? What's a, what's a second-rate wife? She's a concubine. She has no inheritance. She is provided for. Her, her daily needs and everything are taken care of. But her children, they don't get any inheritance. They're not the heir. What's Sarah? She's the wife. First wife. What? It's her child that is going to be the inheritor. Verse 23, but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. And he's talking about fleshly activities in amongst Galatia. But he that was of the free woman was by promise. Now, did God promise you and I eternal life? Yes. Okay. Are we by promise? Yes. Which things are an allegory? Now, we have a parable and an allegory. Both are a figurative description of real facts. Okay, we have a parable. We tell this story. Could be a true story, could not be a true story. But we tell the story, but that story gives us another teaching. Okay, right? The, uh, but the difference between a parable and an allegory, they both do the same thing, but an allegory is a historical event, which would be a pattern for something else that we're to learn from. Okay? Did Abraham have Ishmael through Hagar? Yes. Did he have Isaac through Sarah? Yes. What happened to Hagar and Ishmael? They were cast out. Why? Because the bondwoman and her son shall not be heir. They're not the inheritor. Was that legitimate? Yes. Did that actually happen? Yes. Now here's the teaching of it. Here's the allegorical teaching of a real event. There's a pattern in that. And he said, cast out the bond because you're free. Verse 24, which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai where? In Arabia. Not here. In Arabia. And it's in bondage. Now, isn't that interesting? Both the nation of Israel and the Muslims claim that the Arabians are out of Ishmael. Both groups. Okay? Those who want to be in a part of that are in bondage. Why? Because this is the bondwoman's area. This is the bondwoman's son's area. This is what came out of that. Okay? He said, you go under this, you are entering in a realm that's under bondage. They're the bond people, is what he's saying. And he said... For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem. So Mount Sinai is answering to Jerusalem. That's here. It's up here. And guess what? They're in bondage together. 
What's going on in Jerusalem at the time when Paul is saying, we've got the priesthood still intact, but is it functioning as God would have it to function? No, it's defunct. Why? They rejected the Messiah and they never repented of that, right? They never said, oh, we were wrong, we missed them, this is the first coming. We need to get on board. No, absolutely not, they did not. And you know what the result of that was? God destroying that temple. About the time the end of our Bible is completed, guess what? That temple is being wiped out. Okay? Be it known. Acts 28, Paul says this. Acts 28, 28. Be it known therefore unto you that salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, that they will hear it. Salvation is sent to the Gentiles, that they will hear it. And you know what? Not long after that, guess what happens? Temple is no more. Interesting, huh? So now, so this temple that's in Jerusalem and these two here are in the same problem, in the same yoke. And he says, the law that was given here is being run by here, and they're all, they're, on, they're, they're a slave. And he says, you going to go under that? Verse 26, but he said, but Jerusalem which is above is free. What's he talking about there? Jerusalem that's in heaven. Which is the mother of us all. Sorry, Galatians 5, Galatians 4.26. I move back. Galatians 4.26. But Jerusalem which is above is free. Which is the mother of us all. And then he quotes scripture. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate has many more children than she which hath an husband. And he says, the Jerusalem from the front is breaking, from above is breaking forth. Where is that Jerusalem located? In heaven. What's he equating that to? We got a bunch of saints in Galatia and all over the world. And they're from Jerusalem that is above, not from this. They're not from this system. They're not from the law system. They're not from Jerusalem here on earth. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. In the past, was he the God of the Gentiles? Was he, was he a husband to the Gentile nations or was he a husband to whom? Israel. Excellent point. Thank you very much. Excellent point. Who was a husband to Israel? The God of Israel. And what did they do? Go running around, hoarding around on them. Right. Now, brethren, verse 28, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Did God promise you eternal life? Amen. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Okay? Born of the Spirit. What's the issue that's going on? And you see the issue that's going on today still. One that was born of the flesh is persecuting the one that's born of the Spirit. What was going on when Paul was... You know, what, what's the issue he's dealing with? He's g dealing with law-type doctrine that has come in to an established region... 
that is contrary. It's the same type of thinking that is that 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 is fighting Paul. Okay. Verse thirty. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Jerusalem is the woman. This is her son. Okay? Jerusalem is referred to as a woman. Then the scriptures make sense. Okay? So, so Jerusalem under the law. Jerusalem under the law. This Jerusalem right here. At that time, what is that Jerusalem under? The law. The law. Okay, well, what, but what physically are they under? They're under that. Why? Because they rejected their Messiah. Okay? So now, and her son. Okay? The Arabians come out of Ishmael. He has 12 sons. They become 12 princes. And out of them, what happens? They become the Arabians. Both groups agree. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So we've got the bondwoman right here, and the free woman is up there. Follow that? We're of that one. The allegory is, is that this physical thing, display of time of what happened, okay, the events that happened, we can take that, and they are a pattern to teach us something else. And it's telling us, and said, no, we're not of this Jerusalem right here. We're of a Jerusalem which is above. Jerusalem is not under above, which is not under bondage. This Jerusalem is. And her son. Follow that? So is it talking about um, just being I'm confused because the Gentiles are not promised a city. So are we, is it making the point that we are, um, we're not under bondage, we're of the free woman? But is it making, uh, yeah, I'm just a little confused here. I guess what's the confusion? Well, because you're talking about, so what's the point he's trying to make to the Gentiles? Obviously that they're not under the law. The point that he's making is, is that no, the, they, they are not under the law, and the laws now. Now, what they have, what they have, is that going to be better by bringing in this? No. But he's talking to a mixed audience. He sure is. So okay. Yep. Yeah. So. I mean, the, the big point, I mean, the, the whole topic of the whole book of Galatians is dealing with the law coming in and why it shouldn't be there. Okay? In and amongst the mixed audience. But the big thing is, is he's saying, separate. Now, when he says, cast the bond woman out, those that are bringing in this doctrine, what is he saying? Do what Abraham did. Send them packing on a, with a bottle of water. You're an heir. Okay, so. All right, we'll end with that here. This is, uh, I might go through most of the stuff here again um, next week. Because there's a lot here. But I just kind of want to get rolling through it and back up a little bit here with it just to kind of, there's a lot to this and this, uh, these passages used to give me fits for a while. I didn't understand it. And then all of a sudden, things started to make sense. You know? And how does that happen? Well, when, when I don't understand something, I don't beat my head against that particular sentence or that, you know, that section of that book anymore. I just keep reading. And I read, and I read, and I keep reading, and I keep reading, and I keep reading, and then, you know, you get to the end of that, you start over, and you start reading, you read, and reading, and reading, and reading, and reading, and don't worry about it. Because I, 
you know, here's the reality of it is, is that until you have this picture about these other things going on that he's talking about in the Old Testament, how well are you set up for what he's talking about here? If I didn't know anything about Ishmael and what happened with Ishmael after that, which we, is revealed in the Old Testament, how would, I, you know, how would I even know what he's talking about? Now, Paul's writing from the perspective that you have a Bible. That's the interesting thing. You have the information in front of you. So what should we be doing? Normally I'm saying we should be looking back and reading back and coming forward. Reverse back, come forward. When Paul, when Paul quotes something, and this will cause brethren, dear brother in Christ, you know, mid-acts, dispensational people, fits when I say, when he's quoting scripture back there, it means something relevant. That example there, he's putting it there for a reason. Okay, and what's he saying there? What happened? What happened during that time with Ishmael? A whole nation, a whole group of people came out of that. So, you, you, this book is designed to make you think. This isn't some mindless thing that says, do this, do that, don't do that. And there you go, done. Okay, so, all right. Well, with that, let's pray and I'll let you go. Dear Father, I just want to thank you for your word. just want to just thank you for everything that you made us in Christ. I want to thank you for building us up with your doctrine. We just want to thank you for giving us an opportunity that we never knew existed. I just want to just thank you for these blessings. Amen.